Welcome everybody, gorgeous sunshine. I can't believe you're here. We'll get you outside soon. So this is lecture number nine, I believe. Can you believe it? Uh, I'm so excited to have Dr. Fred Holly here. He's going to start his talk in a few minutes. But first, we're going to take a little journey with me to Victoria, BC. It's all started on the clipper. This was a mother-daughter getaway, so rare. And the whole reason I'm telling you this is think about what happens to your feet, all these places that I'm going. So nothing happened here with feet. We didn't jump over it. By Seattle. And the first place we went to after the hotel was Craig Durach Castle. Sorry, Craig Durach Castle. I think it's Scottish. And although the little map said it was maybe four or five blocks from her hotel, I think it was at least a mile and a half. So we walked there, it was fabulous, uh, walked up and down the stairs, of course castle stairs are very interesting. It was really a, a find, a historic treasure. This is, really doesn't do it justice. In fact, we're not in the lobby, we're one floor up, looking up at several different floors and staircases where this uh, uh, amazing oak, um, and it was just, it was stunning. So lots of stairs, lots of walking. Then we made a journey to, I'm sure you've all been there, Food Shark Gardens, it was gorgeous. In fact, it was pouring rain, I thought, crap, but then the clouds opened, and we arrived there, and so everything was covered with water. It was beautiful. And this is kind of the very top part where you look down into that sunken garden. It's so gorgeous. And even though it's you know early in the season, it's just devastatingly beautiful. So, of course, lots of walking around in the garden paths. Then we jumped on a plane. This is actually, can you see it? There it is. That's actually sunken garden there. This is the um, aerial version of Bouchard Gardens, so it's really quite a nice map. And then, of course, coming back in the tour, here's the Parliament buildings. We took a tour. Actually, it was very interesting to learn a bit of uh, Canadian history, and I've lived in Canada for a while. But the tour was given by a man who seemed like he was Hispanic, and he said, oh, I'm from Mexico. <laughs> he seemed to know more about Canada than most Canadians, so it's really kind of cute. But on the outside steps, there was a band, and it turns out it was a band from Seattle, so go figure. But lots more steps. So we're thinking about all these all these places we're walking, and many more I didn't show you, and all the wear and tear it has on your feet. And I think um, this is a perfect time to have Fred come up and start his talk. He's one of our polyclinic podiatrists, um, has done a fantastic job for so many of my patients already, and I'm delighted to have him come and talk. Let me get you a slideshow for that. All right. Well, thank you very much, Susan. And I, I despise the whole microphone lecturing uh, setting. I'd much rather be sitting around a table with you just kind of having a dialogue, but we'll work with this format. So, uh, I was, oh, and this has wheels, so <laughs> I have an injury right up here, thank you. Um, so, I was uh, really excited when Susan uh, gave me the opportunity to come and speak with you because it, the, the program that you are involved in sounds uh, phenomenal. And I think that the personalized uh, approach and the individualized approach that you, you have um, is really setting up for success. Um, and so you, you might think, well, why have a podiatrist come and talk? And, and uh, I think at least one of you could probably answer that question. We have a little wounded warrior here, but uh, you know, I see every day, all day, um, problems with painful condition that keep, keep people from doing what they want to do. And that often includes activity, and that often includes their goals as far as weight loss or athletics. And so, um, I thought I think it does make sense to, to to have me here talking. I I've prepared some slides and I have some specific things to talk about, but I really want to carve out time um, to uh, to talk. You're welcome to ask questions as we go. I'd rather this be more a dialogue than a lecture. Um, but certainly at the end, um, if there's some specific things you have questions about, or even if you have specific problems that you want to ask questions about here, it's a great setting to do so. So. Um, the, what, is, what is a podiatrist? A lot of people don't know. I don't know how many people in this room have been to a podiatrist before, but uh, the DPM after my name is Doctor of Podiatric Medicine. So I'm a doctor who just specializes in problems of the foot and ankle, and all the other big long stuff just has to do with surgery that I do. But if you don't know what a podiatrist does, uh, I, a little bit about my background, I grew up in Edmonds and spent my life here in Seattle and um, under, did my undergraduate work at Seattle Pacific University got a degree in biology like a lot of pre-meds do, uh, went on to four years of medical or podiatry school in San Francisco, uh, followed by three years of foot and ankle surgery residency, which is kind of the focus of my treatment, although um, 
if it's kind of below the knee, the, it, I, I treat it. So if it's an ingrown toenail, or if it's a lawnmower crush, or whatever, anything in between, um, uh, that's kind of all within the scope of, of what I take care of. So that's a little bit of background about me and about what is podiatry. Um, so we're going to talk about fitness in your feet. Uh, really, I think a lot of this should focus on pre preventative things that we can do. But then I also picked out some of the more common things that I see in the clinic with people with problems that people have related to weight-bearing activity. And we'll talk about that in some depth and then kind of have an open forum for discussion. Um, and, and some of these slides, I think, are probably going to be uh, information you already know. Some of this is stuff I prepared for a different lecture. But, but the benefits of exercise, I, I really don't think that this can be overemphasized. Uh, and some of these things I assume you've talked about in the past. Um, I know that I think you had a cardiologist come and talk once. Is that right? What, what other, for those of you who've been to some of these lectures, what other type of specialists have you heard from? I'm curious. Oh, really? <laughs> um, a hypnotist, okay. What else? Diet, did you have anybody? Dietitian, nutrition, have you guys talked about that? Sugar, 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 Okay. Yeah, what other kind of things? Like, have you had any, any physical trainer, anything in that kind of? Yeah, last month, personal trainer. Okay. A bit more just discussion about things and a bit of a demo. We had uh, endocrinology, we had sleep medicine. All right. And, uh, Cover all sorts of yeah. territory here. Okay. Well, then a lot of these things you've probably covered. You know, cardiovascular health, aerobic exercise has been proven to decrease blood pressure and increase circulation. You know, the, the second one, mental health, I think, and we were even just talking about this beforehand. Um, fitness, and I don't want to just say weight loss or exercise, but fitness, in my experience, personally and in interacting with patients, can be huge, this mental health piece. Um, my, my wife is an avid runner, and, and she loves to run, and I can't stand to run. So not all that long ago, it was, she'd been really sick, and, and it was like 2 in the morning, and I thought I heard this pounding noise, and I, and, and I got up, and she was on her treadmill running, and, just, and she's like, for her, it just it makes her feel better, and I think if I was doing that, I would be getting sick. So, for, but for me, you get me on a bike, you get me out on a, a mountain bike, and I can't think of anything better. And so I think part of what hopefully you guys have already talked about is, is that there's no one fit for everybody. You know, so many people just focus on running for exercise. But there are certainly a number of other things we can talk about. Some of you talked about some of those things last month with your, with your trainer. But um, I guess the thought being, find the thing that you enjoy that fits with your lifestyle and your physical capacities, and then make it work and enjoy it. Um, Overall health, disease prevention, certainly weight-bearing activities can decrease the chance of osteoporosis and things like that. Um, this management of diseases, boy, you know, in, in what I do, diabetes is just a, um, uh, something that I am involved in treating on a daily basis. And uh, the, the focus on getting those blood sugars under control, getting the weight off, staying active, it, it literally, I've seen it, you know, save people's limbs because I unfortunately have to get involved with the complications of diabetes, which oftentimes for me can be wounds and even amputations. And, and so I don't take this stuff lightly because literally I've seen this change people's lives and, and health and outcomes. Um, some somewhat interesting facts. Uh, every minute that you walk, They've done these studies that show adds two minutes to your life. So there aren't that many ways that you can get a guarantee. Well, I don't know if I'd say guarantee. Don't hold me to that. But a, a statistically significant chance of increasing their longevity. But, but weight-bearing aerobic activity does that. Um, it's never too late to start. We, you know, I, I love the mix of people that I see here that whether you're earlier or later on in um, starting up with uh, getting healthy and fit, you know, when is the best time to start that? Today is the best time to start that if you haven't already. Um, the study shows certainly that um, as we mature, that those who are more physically fit and are participating in consistent aerobic exercise, um, a number of studies shows you know overall health is significantly improved. Um, this next, this is a pretty significant statistic that uh, in the United States, studies show that physical inactivity can contribute to 
you know, almost a third of a million deaths every year. Um, that should get our attention. Uh, and this is just kind of an interesting fact. It, uh, depending on who you read, but the average person walks at least two, if not three <coughs> times the circumference of the world during their lifetime. lifetime. And so you're putting a lot of mileage on those feet, those little trips up to Victoria, add to the mileage. But uh, that's, where we, that's where I start to see folks with some struggles and, and, uh, and try to help them out. Um, this is supposed to remind me to tell a story. And the story is that you don't have to approach this alone. Um, and if you look at this picture, you might think that I'm an accomplished fisherman, but I am absolutely not. That's the purpose of this, this slide, is um, if you were to put me out on that lake by myself, I would spend the day catching nothing. Um, but when I spent the day, this is, this is a, a, a lake in northern Minnesota. My wife's from back there, and her family are big-time fishermen. And, and the point I'm trying to make, and I'll get there, is that with the right training and time and experience, you can see success. And it doesn't happen overnight. Um, one of the last times when my son was younger and I took him fishing, just he and I, we caught no fish and one duck. <laughs> so, uh, but this day, I was fishing with uh, my uh, wife's uncle, who had probably had a cabin up on that lake for 20, 30 years, who knew every spot in the lake, who knew what bait, what time of day. He had the equipment, he had the fish finder, and he literally, Fred, cast over there with this, let it go this far down, and this is what I came up with. Um, the, the moral of that story is, as you approach this, don't feel like it's going to happen overnight, and don't get discouraged if you don't see the successes that you see with your friends around you, or, boy, I'm not making the progress I want. It, it takes time, it takes coaching. Uh, I think it oftentimes takes rubbing shoulders with others who are going through the same thing um, before you'll see success. So I, I guess I would just encourage you to be diligent and patient and, and have some fun along the way. So, oh, I was gonna not show that slide. The anatomy of the foot, if anyone saw it, you can't answer. How many bones are in the foot? Yeah. You can throw out an answer, a guess. 20 or getting close? 26 for the average patient. There are special ones, but uh, 26 bones in the foot. The foot's a pretty complex structure. Um, over 30, almost 35 joints, over 100 ligaments. So there are a lot of things that are working uh, in concert, and there are a lot of things that then can potentially be injured. We'll talk about some of those. Uh, impact factors. Um, just walking on a flat surface, because you're lifting and heel striking, you're putting about one and a half times your body weight through that weight bearing surface. And the more body weight we carry, the more pressure we're putting through. When you bump that up to something like running or jogging, you're putting almost three or four times your body weight of force through your feet uh, and your weight bearing joints. And then when you get to things like court sports, like you know uh, basketball and other things, that goes up significantly. So again, and especially in some of these sports down here, as you see, uh, the force go up, you tend to see more strain and more injury. Um, injury, <laughs> I love this slide. Injury prevention. Uh, a lot of it really, you know, I think if we're doing physically demanding activities that are walking or swimming or cycling, um, it's important to stretch and warm up beforehand. And not to just get out and go cold. There are there are there are a couple studies in particular that show even just a few minutes of stretching beforehand can really significantly decrease um, musculoskeletal injury, um, position clearance, and monitoring before activities. And I think you, you all I'm preaching to the choir because you're participating in a pro program like this. But making sure that your activity is specific and, and um, consistent with your your physical health. Um, Proper training, again, starting slow. Remember, it's gonna take time to adapt to new activities. You're gonna have aches and pains that you didn't have before. Uh, those should generally subside. If they don't, that's when you need to kind of pursue talking to somebody about uh, treatment of what could be a potential problem. So, um, what do you guys like to do for exercise? Who in the room exercise, and if so, what do you like or what do you do and don't like? Three, number three, cycling. You and I need to go have coffee. <laughs> I like your style. Um, is that a new thing for you? Have you been cycling for a long time? Yeah? 
What do you like about it? Just happiness. <laughs> yeah, I know it is. And, and, and it's interesting, guys, you being it's like you're a kid again, you're being outdoors, you're riding on a bike, how much better can you get? What else? I like biking a lot. Yeah. Okay. Walking. Walking. I love to go. Okay. This slide, really I tried to capture, well, what are some of the things that you, that you can do to be physically fit, to get your heart rate up, that aren't impact, that don't put a lot of strain on joints? Um, certainly swimming in rock or water rugs, you know, the buoyancy and decreases gravity and doesn't put strain on joints. Um, so I send a lot of folks to do these kind of things because most of the things I'm treating have problems with weight bearing, you know, pain with weight bearing. Cycling's great. Uh, elliptical trainer, you're weight bearing but you're not impact. Um, walking, a lot of it depends on the surface, you know, um, trying to avoid really uneven surfaces. If you have a, a school around your home that has one of those padded tracks, that's much better shock absorption than getting out on the concrete. Um, and then as you kind of increase the, the physical demands, running, um, that certainly increases force. We talked about that slide earlier, through joints, feet, hips, knees, um, court sports and things that goes up from there. <coughs> So from my perspective, what kind of things can you do to prevent injuries? One of them is, is, is just what are you wearing for support? Um, I have a couple resources at the end if you have any interest in them. One of them is just a recommended shoe list. So it's uh, if you're a runner, here's a couple great, you know, a few great shoes to look at. If you're a walker or a hiker or uh, some dress shoes. Um, I also, there's a, a shoe store in the Seattle area that I send a lot of folks to. It's called Shoes and Feet. I have no connection with them other than they just take great care of people. Um, and, and so I've also got some info on them and a way you get little discount coupons if you go in there. But, but from my perspective, this is, this is starting with your foundation. Um, and, and oftentimes people will come in and ask me, well, what's the best tennis shoe? Well, it depends on, it depends on a lot of things. So the, the best shoe for you may be very different than for me because you have a different frame than I do. I might have a higher arch, you might have a flat foot. So I don't always just say go get the Brooks Addiction or get the Nike whatever, but um, I think it's really important to go to a place that is knowledgeable and carries good quality shoes. And a lot of the places, I don't know if you've had this experience, but uh, I kind of love to go shoe shopping because people don't know what I do. Um, <laughs> and when they're kind of selling me a line, I can tell them I'm losing anything. But, um, but a lot of shoe stores anymore, you go there and you're going to get, no offense, but a high school student who doesn't know um, much about what they're doing. And they, yeah, I, when was the last time anyone had someone actually even measure your foot, you know? Um, so it's important to go to the right place to get the right shoe. Um, the socks is even important, especially, uh, they make a lot of, socks have come a long way. They have a lot of socks now that have a wicking material, so if you perspire a lot, which can cause friction, which can cause blisters, um, they have things available for that. Seamless socks, if you get uh, irritations from the seam of the sock, if you're diabetic, that can be a problem. Um, and then there's a whole, I mean, we can have a whole hour-long discussion just about the right support in the shoe. Um, sometimes that's with something over the counter that's a better arc support. We do a lot of what we call custom made orthotics, where we make a custom made arc support based on the architecture of your foot and what kind of problem we're trying to address. And that's a lot more detailed, but I guess it's just important to focus on this. Starting with good shoes, and then if you're still having problems, going to see somebody who can maybe help you beyond that. Proper shoe fit. This is uh, may, this may be pretty obvious, but. The idea being that you want to have about a thumb width from the tip of your toe to the tip of that shoe. And it's important to know that most of us have one foot that might be almost a half size larger than the other. So don't always just try on the right shoe. You might be in the wrong fit. Uh, <clears throat> fitting at the time of day actually even makes a difference. And when you buy shoes, um, the longer we stand and weight bear, oftentimes the more swelling if you struggle with swelling. Um, so if you go and buy a, get fit for a shoe earlier in the day, then towards the end of the day, that shoe might not fit you too well. So it's, it's wise to go later in the day or after activity. Um, the proper last, that just has to do with the shape of the shoe relative to the shape of your foot. Um, various shoes, you know, there, there's a whole, uh, a whole debate about this new, so they call it a minimalist shoe. Basically it's almost like running barefoot or walking with no support. And um, I'm not a huge advocate of that. I've read the stuff and I know the theory behind it, but I, and I think that's fine, but I tend to see more people who maybe have had problems or struggled with that. So I'm typically talking about 
shoes that have oops, let's get back there. Um, really good control, stability, shock absorption. Oftentimes you can find that in a shoe. Sometimes you can find that in an in insole. Um, there's this really kind of interesting shoe. This, this makes me think of it. Uh, it's called a Z coil. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but it looks like a big slinky underneath your heel. <clears throat> there's a lady who works in our operating room, and she just swears by them because they, I mean, they just complete shock absorption. They, they have some things that they lack, but um, there's a lot of stuff out there specific for whatever your activity might be. So skin problems um, related to feet and activity, blistering is probably the most common thing that I see. That comes from friction or usually moisture and friction. So that's why controlling that moisture for feet perspire a lot. Even something that uh, I, I saw a patient today, and this was her main struggle. And uh, I'll have people just use topical antiperspirant on their feet if they really struggle with perspiration a lot. Because it can lead to skin breakdown and problems. Um, you know, a lot of people get blisters in the back of the heel, if the heel of the shoe rubs back there. A place like this, Shoes and Feet, has some great either gel stuff that can be put in the back of the heel or mole skin. But um, it's important if you're taking, you know, thousands of steps, if there are point, there's a point of friction, that skin's going to break down. Athlete's foot's a fungal infection. That's a common problem that can be pretty quickly treated in most cases with topical medication. Um, toenails is another whole big thing that I see. Um, whether you exercise or not, uh, as we mature, I'll use the word mature, um, it's common to get problems with your nails where they kind of get thick and they don't look real um, pleasant. And if those nails are thick and then they rub on a shoe, you can get trauma to the nail and you can get bleeding or an ingrown nail or an infection. Um, I see this a lot in runners, especially in distance runners, where uh, or downhill skiers, anything that just, their foot's doing this to the front of that shoe over and over. That can lead to the need to come and see somebody like me. And sometimes that's treating with a medication cleared up. Sometimes that's removing a nail. Um, but that's a pretty common problem. We talked about the moisture. Soft tissue injuries. This is again starting to get into what I what I see regularly. Um, ankle sprains. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Um, muscle strains. Tendonitis. Achilles tendonitis. And there's a couple other types of tendonitis around the ankle that are very common. This plantar fasciitis, we're going to spend some time talking about that. That diagnosis alone is probably going to put both of my kids through college. Because <laughs> there's so many people with this problem. Um, but that's a frustrating problem. Um, that's a very frustrating problem. Um, nail injuries, we talked about knee problems in runners. Really, really common. Often having to do with that impact. And that's where something like an orthotic can make a very significant difference. Because if that structure, if that foundation is off, Boy, you can get strained through joints uh, all the way up the chain. Um, shin splints is another pretty common problem that I see. Bone injuries, very common. Uh, you know, broken bones, fractures, stress fractures. This is a pretty common thing just with walkers. Um, it, and it doesn't have to specifically be an injury, but it's more of what we call an overuse or repetitive trauma. So just, I walked a lot more than I normally walk. There are certain medical conditions that make you more prone to this, certainly osteoporosis or certain medicines, like if you're on prednisone or other things. But some people will come in and they'll be like, for the last three or four weeks, every time I walk, my foot gets kind of swollen and kind of red, and it hurts right behind my toes, and uh, it's not getting better. Um, and and that's, a, that's a very common problem that requires treatment, and could, in some instances, can be prevented even just by having the right structure or support around your foot when you're walking. Injury treatment, that's pretty straightforward, just that whole, you'll, you'll hear therapists and things talk about this rest, ice, compression, elevation if you've had an injury. Um, so, let's talk about a few specific problems. I, um, this, is, this is probably the most common problem that I see. And uh, if you want to raise your hand, your hand, you can or not, but I don't know how many people in this room have had heel pain, but uh, I'm seeing a couple of little, uh, yeah, see, look at that, all right? We can have a little support group for professionals. <laughs> But this, uh, I'm going to take a few minutes and talk about what this is and how you treat it and how you potentially prevent it. Um, but plantar fasciitis is a very, very common problem. On the bottom of your foot, there's this structure. It's called the plantar fascia. It's a big ligament. And it starts back in the heel and it runs right up towards the front of your foot. When you stand down, it helps support and stabilize your arch. And um, it's very common for it to get painful and inflamed right back where it attaches to the heel bone back there. Um, 
usually it's underneath the heel. You can get symptoms that sometimes spread out into the artery and up into your toes. Um, it's important to try to catch it as early as you start to have symptoms instead of waiting six or nine months and then finally thinking, oh, I'm going to go see somebody about this. Uh, because in most instances, it can be treated successfully. Um, every once in a while, it goes on to kind of more chronic pain that requires more aggressive treatment. Um, this, I get asked this question so often. When I see somebody for plantar fasciitis, usually I can diagnose it without an x-ray. And people are just convinced I have a bone spur and I need a surgery to cut off my bone spur. And, and I'd say probably 30 years ago, that was the thinking that, oh, there's a bone spur. And if you just go in there and cut off that bone spur, everything will be fine. They've done some newer studies that show if you just took x-rays of everybody in this room, probably, or this is a pretty small room, but probably 20% of us have a bone spur and don't have any symptoms. So the bone spur is not typically a, so a, a cause of the pain. Every once in a while it is, but for the most part, that's, that's secondary. Um, so what does this feel like? Uh, most often, it's this pain when you first get up after rest. Now, I feel fine when I wake up in the morning, but as soon as I step out of the bed to go to the bathroom, I'm hobbling. And if I kind of get moving, it gets a little bit better, and if I get it stretched out, I do okay. Um, but then if I'm on it a lot, it hurts. Or if, uh, if I go and rest or I drive to work and I get up out of my car, oh, I feel that pain again. Um, most people notice that um, it hurts more when they don't really have a good supportive shoe or if they're walking barefoot. So I just pound into people. Um, I'll tell you in a minute, my wife suffered from a really significant bout of this, and, and anymore, literally, when I hear her get up, I hear her slip into her little shoes, and she flip plops into the bathroom, and down. But, but going barefoot uh, when you have this problem is, is the enemy. Um, I talked about in later stages, it can be progressive. And it varies in pain, but most people just kind of have this dull, they call it a stone bruise feeling underneath their heel. There's a little nerve in that area that can get affected where you get some sharper pains or even some numbness underneath the heel. Those can all go along hand in hand with this. Um, I just thought it was an interesting picture. It doesn't really have anything to do with this. But I see people who come in like this every day and they want me to fix their problem. Um, biomechanical abnormalities. What causes this? I mean, we're not certain exactly what causes it. A lot of times it's an overuse. A lot of times the foot architecture, the foot structure has a lot to do with it. Uh, by biomechanical abnormalities, that would mean things like a real, real high arch, or a real low arch, a really tight Achilles tendon. That's very commonly associated with this. Wearing the wrong shoes. Waking. Um, th this is another thing that if you, if you have put on pounds and you notice more pain in that area, that's common. I mean, it just makes sense. You're just burying more load through a structure, and, and its response oftentimes is pain. I, I, I vividly remember a guy who uh, I just tried and tried to help him with his plantar fasciitis. And we did almost everything, and he kind of got a little better, he got a little worse, got a little better. And he worked at an auto parts store by where I used to practice. And I went in there, I don't know, I hadn't seen him in six months, and hey, I, I always hesitate to ask about how their problem is, but he's like, hey, Doc, I'm doing great. I'm like, oh, good. And I'm thinking, I wish I could take credit for this. Like, what a, you know, how did you finally get better? He said, you know that 40 pounds I always struggled with? I finally got the weight off, and it just, my pain went away. So, you know, I also see petite 105 pound women with this problem. So it's not always weight related, but certainly I think it's oftentimes an aggravating factor. Um, work surfaces, working on a hard surface, I used to practice it by Boeing and Everett in the number of people who work on that concrete surface that have this problem is um, staggering. Um, these are just some other causes of heel pain. I think not really specifically pertinent to our conversation today, other than there are a lot of different um, causes, plantar fasciitis being the most common. Um, evaluating and treating, well, it's usually diagnosed by a physical exam, uh, watching your walk, that arch type, x-rays, like I said, not usually necessary unless you're just not getting better uh, the way we think you would. Uh, things like ultrasound and MRI are sometimes used to diagnose this if there's really any question, but that's pretty rare. Um, so I think the important thing is how you treat it. And, and there are a couple of, I guess, general approaches. One is mechanical, and the other is controlling the pain and inflammation. So mechanical things can be things like stretching and the right support and avoiding going barefoot uh, and sometimes plug in with a physical therapist. And the anti-inflammatory portion of this can be things like the oral anti-inflammatories, the Motrins and Advils. Um, 
sometimes using an oral steroid, like a medicine called prednisone. Frequently, uh, if these get stubborn, we end up injecting them with cortisone, which isn't the, I don't know how many people in this room have had that. It's not the probably most pleasant thing you'd have done, but it can make a pretty significant difference. And then, then for those cases that get more stubborn, there's more aggressive things. Um, oh, this is just a, it's kind of an interesting picture. So if you don't read foot MRIs every day, this might not make a lot of sense to you, but this is somebody's heel bone. So that dark line, your leg would be up here. This is the Achilles tendon coming down and attaching. This is that plantar fascia. So if you can picture really like that right up there. All that white is not supposed to be there. That's inflammation. Um, when you have plantar fasciitis, this <coughs> ligament should be more than about three or four millimeters in thick. And that's just, that's interesting to me because that's what I take care of. Um, so we talked about stretching, icing, using a night splint. Um, it's basically something you wear that just stretches that foot and leg out for hours at night. It can really help. It can be really frustrating to be used to using. Um, we talked about arch support, you know, orthotics, anti-inflammatories, PT. Um, and then this last one, you know, I'm a surgeon. This is a problem that I rarely treat surgically. Over 90% of the time we can treat it without surgery. There's some cool new, newer stuff going on out there with this there's these injections of these platelets where we take your own blood cells, spin them down, take the growth factors, and inject them in areas. That's kind of a new area that's not proven yet, but it's shown some success. There's a, a standard surgery that used to be done for this where we go and actually cut that ligament away from the heel bone, which um, has its potential complications. So right, we try to avoid that. There's a, this is what I'm pretty excited about. There's a, a, a newer procedure, um, if you ever see it in my notes from me, um, it's a, it's a non-invasive technique where we go and use a little, it looks like a little zapper, like what are you doing? But it, it's, it's a number of little pinpoint areas that's done under anesthesia where we go in and, and debride or take away some of that inflamed scar tissue and it causes your body to blow in, to grow in new blood vessels and heal. It has a very high success rate. Um, it's an outpatient thing. You can walk on it you know, afterwards. Within a few weeks, you're usually back to normal activity. And, um, uh, I know firsthand because my wife's plantar fasciitis that we dealt with for a little over a year, maybe a year and a half, finally got to the point where I had one of my friends do this procedure on her. I'm smart enough not to operate on my wife. But, uh, and it was the thing that really just turned this around. So it's not done very often, but it's, it, if you know people who are just stuck and they've tried everything else, the whole point of that is there's some cool newer stuff that's less invasive that might work. Here's another common problem that I see, something called a Morton's neuroma. Um, this typically shows up as a sharp, burning pain in the ball of the foot. Um, usually it's at the base of the toes. Sometimes it extends these little tingling numbness out into a couple of toes. Um, most often aggravated by activity. Again, when I wear a shoe, when I don't wear a shoe and I walk on the hardwood floor, I get this pain in the ball of my foot. Uh, I feel like something's on fire in my foot. I feel like I'm walking on a rock. I notice any time I wear an elevated heel, it puts more pressure there and causes pain. Um, this is a diagram of what, what it looks like. This is actually kind of what people describe as the way it feels, too. Just this burning pain near the base of the toes, and it's this inflamed or enlarged nerve. Sometimes calls, comes from an injury, oftentimes from overuse or just aggravation, um, and, and it can be a quite a painful problem. Um, how do we diagnose it? Um, it's usually, again, based on a physical exam, and I can usually, it's, it's great, I have, I'm relatively new to the polyclinic, so I have a new medical assistant working with me, and she's pretty excited now, because she can usually take the history and come out and tell me what the diagnosis is. So, usually you can make this diagnosis without a lot of x-rays and MRIs and things, but um, hurts when you press near the base of your toes, hurts when you push your foot together from side to side, because as you can see, that, that nerve lives right between these two bones, and so it, Women who wear a narrow shoe, they usually find that that really aggravates it. Um, sometimes the numbness in the toes, and then if, if you're worried about arthritis or something else, we'll take an x-ray and it'll be normal, and that kind of further confirms the diagnosis. Treating this, right shoes, cortisone injections oftentimes, uh, custom orthotics can be helpful, you know, not often needed, but um, sometimes a little padding in the shoe, um, and if it's bad enough, we'll go in and actually take out that damaged nerve. Another common problem, ankle sprains. I just want you to quickly memorize this. I'm going to do a quiz in a minute. But, um, this is just an image of the outside of the foot. So uh, uh, an ankle sprain is injury to a ligament in the ankle. 
And a ligament is a structure that attaches bone to bone. So there's three little ligaments on the outside of your ankle that help stabilize it from rolling in and out. And frequently, this one or these two get injured, and that oftentimes comes from a twisting injury. So a sprain, if you hear people say sprain, it's really the same thing as a, a partially torn or a torn ligament. They mean the same thing. Uh, it's one of the most common causes. It's probably the number one, when they do all these studies, they show that it's about the number one or number two visit to the emergency room for any sort of lower extremity problem. Um, and also, when I was recently looking at a study, which was several years old, that showed the average emergency room visit costs a minimum of a couple thousand dollars. I know that's got to be old numbers. Um, there's a lot of money spent on diagnosing and treating this problem. Um, oftentimes it comes from uneven surfaces. Oftentimes can be prevented um, just by watching the activity, the, the surface that you walk or run on, um, what shoe gear you're using. For some people who have unstable ankles, doing something with a support of some type. This is where we get involved with helping people. Some of these things are you know, off the shelf, $25 at the drugstore. Some of them get to be more specially made. Um, but they can be very helpful in preventing those types of injuries. Um, treating your ankle sprain. Most people who I treat who have an ankle sprain don't have this look on their face. Uh, excuse me, more frowning. But um, sprains, the one thing to know about sprains, they, they're frustrating. They can take longer than a broken bone to heal. A lot of swelling and a lot of residual pain. So again, the idea is doing those preventative things to prevent these things from happening. Um, so as far as the, the, the formal part of this conversation, I guess the take home measure is you're walking around on a very complex structure, your feet and your ankles. Right shoes and the right support are really vital at prevention and treating a lot of problems. Um, this is kind of a key one. If something's hurting, that's a red flag that something's not right. And um, when you get into troubles, when you don't really address that. So get in to see your physician and if need be the specialist. Uh, take good care of your feet because um, they're going to be with you for a lifetime. Um, these are, I, I should have, if you have any interest, you might want to write these down. These are just a few resources that I thought of and areas that I frequently point my patients to. Um, they're websites that are really helpful. Uh, one is the American Podiatric Medical Association. If you go to that website, they have a lot of cool stuff for patients where just learning about foot facts or info about shoes or what shoes does the APMA support. Uh, there's a lot of information there about specific foot problems. Hey, I'm having this pain. It helps you figure out your diagnosis and whether or not you should see a doctor. Um, this one's great. I use this one probably the most. It's called foothealthfacts.org, um, which is put out by a a group that I'm affiliated with, uh, American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons. Um, they, uh, every single day I provide patients with information from that website, so that's a great website to have in your back pocket. A couple of places where I send people often for shoes in this area, shoes and feet, I have a little flyer about them. Um, the closest ones here, there's one in Fremont, there's one in North Seattle, one over in Bellevue, I'm not sure about the South End. And they'd be a great place whether you're looking for a dress shoe or an athletic shoe or a sandal. Uh, they've got a, a small shoe store, wide variety, and really knowledgeable. If you're more of a serious runner, uh, I send a lot of folks to this place called Super Jock and Jill, which is down by Green Lake. And you know, they'll take the time to get you on a treadmill and watch your gait and see how you walk and uh, help you with shoes. So that's really the extent of what I wanted to cover formally, but, but what I'd love to do is if people have specific questions or I have this pain, what do you do for it? I'd love to, to answer those. Yes? Sorry, right, I have a question. My, I go to a trainer and yeah. she is really into minimus, really into that stuff. Uh -huh. And she's got me in that and that's what I wear at this point all the time. Um, you are opposed to it because... I am opposed to it um, well, I, I'm not opposed to it completely. Okay. Like one of my physician friends, who is an avid runner, um, he only runs in those. Now, do, do you use them for day to day or for out running or walking? I use, them, I use them day to day, and I use them. I, look at me, I don't run. I walk. Yeah. I, I like to dance. If you know what I mean, that's my favorite thing. I, I see more problems with folks who use them for running who aren't really. Um, trained to run in the way that they're designed. When you run in that type of shoe, the whole concept is you don't want a heel strike. You're, you're basically running more in the front of your foot. And, uh, and, and so then you may not need as much of that arch support, but right. for most folks, they need the structure and support that a, a shoe like that typically doesn't give them. 
Okay. I don't know if that no, no, no. That really, that that's really helpful. Thank yeah. you. Because yeah. I mean, because I will be thinking when I'm walking <clears throat> to make sure that I am not landing on my heel. I mean, even walking. Yeah, walking probably not as much of an issue, no, no, but no, heel but strike with but, running. But still, I mean, yeah. even that too. Thank yeah. you. Sure. Yes. Can you can you tell if you have arthritis in your feet any way besides an X-ray? Or um, you know, oftentimes a, a pretty good physical exam by somebody who knows the bones and joints can do it. But if it's pain associated with the joint, if it's stiffness in the morning, so depending on the type of arthritis, because there are a number of different types, some are associated with certain illnesses, um, some are more osteoarthritis or wear and tear arthritis, but stiffness, pain at a joint, oftentimes pain with activity or motion, swelling around a joint, those are all red flags. Um, but oftentimes to really get a full assessment of the joint and x-ray is needed. So what, if you find out you have that, what, what are the remedies if any? Oh boy, well that's a, that's a very big okay, question as well. But no, it, it depends. Um, there, there's anything from, if it's a, for example, if it's osteoarthritis or de, uh, yeah. degenerative arthritis, there are some who suggest um, things like there are these supplements called glucosamine, which um, are um, hit and miss on how effective they are, sometimes using anti-inflammatories, sometimes cortisone injections, sometimes there are things that, that um, even with the shoe, for example, I, one of the common things I see is people have arthritis in their toe joints, so when they stand and walk, they get a lot of pain. And for those people, I'll, I'll turn to a place like the shoes and feet and have them get into a relatively stiff sole shoe that has a little bit, we call it a rocker sole. Yeah, which one do you have on? Yeah, so, yours is pretty exaggerated. What brand is that? MVP? Yeah, um, but something that has a little bit of a rocker sole will, when you walk, it just takes stress off of those joints, which reduces pain. Um, some, sometimes if you have uh, a wear and tear arthritis, we can go in and clean it out with a relatively straightforward surgery and have good success. Sometimes it gets really bad and you have to do bigger involved joint fusions and things. But, or if it's not a, a wear and tear arthritis, but if it's more an inflammatory arthritis, then looking for a potential underlying cause of that to see if there's a condition like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis that can be treated medically. So does that answer your question? Anything else? Yes. Do you often recommend something like Superfeet as a preventative measure? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. The, the question is, do I recommend Superfeet, which is an over-the-counter arch support, um, just as preventative. I, I don't think that everybody needs special arch support in their shoes. You might talk to some podiatrists who think so, but I don't think that can really be proven scientifically. I think that with certain conditions, it makes sense and it's been proven to improve uh, problems like that plantar fasciitis. Um, boy, if I, like for example, I don't have pain in my feet. I, I, I don't wear our sports shoes. Can I say that here? But, but, but if you have symptoms, well that's when I'd say, then it's time to start talking about, well what do you do about that? And, and I don't think, while we as podiatrists do a lot of these custom made orthotics, um, boy, spending, um, Thirty or forty dollars on something like a super feed in sole, which you can get at a sporting goods store. There's another great one called Soul S O L E, which they carry at REI. That's a really great starting point before you start uh, potentially having to move on to those custom made orthotics. So not everybody needs them. I frequently see that with kids. You know, I don't, I don't know how many peds you see, but or a mom or dad will come in and they'll, they'll see this. And I used to treat a lot of little, you know two year olds. And they walk, they come in, and they, their little Johnny's foot is so flat. You know, he's not having any problem with it, and, and it's normal for kids to have fat, flat, floppy feet, so you don't need anything. So it's when you have symptoms that I think you address them. Nine more minutes than we have. <laughs> I hate to waste this opportunity. Okay, talk about buttons. Yes. Yeah, I, I didn't choose, I thought about that in retrospect. I guess I could have talked about things like that. It's not so much activity related, but can be aggravated by activity. So what is a bunion? Um, I don't have a diagram. Um, a bunion is, and it just sounds horrible to have a diagnosis like that, doesn't it? Yeah. We use, I call it hollets and olives. I use the medical term because then it sounds a lot more. Because a bunion is something like my grandma, I suppose my great grandmother had bunions. A bunion is a prominent bone near the base of your big toe. And 
oftentimes, I think people think, I just have this bone growth, you know, like if you would just go in there and shave off that bone that's sticking out, it would solve my problem, but it, it's a, uh, it's usually a lot more involved than that. There can be some biomechanical changes in the alignment of the foot where the, the metatarsal bone behind the toe drifts in the wrong direction, big toe drifts in the other direction, that joint that's supposed to be functioning like this is out of alignment, and, and that can cause pain. Now sometimes it is, it's as simple as the right support or an orthotic sometimes can help if you're having joint pain. If you're having pain right where that bunion is prominent um, and you've already got the right shoes and uh, you're not being foolish with the three inch heels and the, the toe box that's like this, um, then that's where we sometimes get involved with surgery um, and, and have a pretty high success rate. But again, I'm a surgeon. I've got a wife who has one foot that had a bunion done before I ever knew her. Uh, and one that has a very significant bunion that doesn't cause her any pain, and so we just look at it and leave it alone. Um, so it doesn't always mean it requires treatment. I usually say if it's if the problem is getting a lot worse, like well, I kind of always had this little bump there, and over the last two years, man, it's drifting, and my big toe starting to, you know, encroach on its little neighbor there. Then you talk about treating it, um, um, but it's when it gets to the point of surgery, it's a pretty involved thing. You don't go into it lightly. Um, Usually, there's a genetic component to this. Like if you, if you look at mom or dad or Uncle Joe's or grandma's feet, somebody's got something similar. Um, oftentimes, people ask me, did my shoes cause this? Shoes don't cause it, but they can certainly aggravate it if you're wearing a shoe that has a really, really narrow toe. If, like, in, like sometimes I get catalogs that are, you know, foot smart, maybe. Yeah, something like that. yeah. They have all these little things. Of Appliances? Like, yeah, for biting the little. <clears throat> rubber things you put between your toes, or I don't know what all it was. And I just always wonder if those really work. Um, you know? th none of them cure the problem. Right. Some of them help reduce symptoms from the problem. So that you talked about the, the pad that fits between the big toe and the second toe. Mm -hmm. If you really notice that your toe is drifting, I mean, it can just act as a buttress to keep that toe from going further. It's not going to solve any problem, but it can prevent progression. The right support can help stabilize the foot to prevent progression with either an insole or an orthotic. Um, but I just had a patient really ask me about this thing called yoga toes. It's just, it, it looks like the kind of thing that my wife puts on when she paints her toenails. It's like, oh, yeah. kind of fits over. And I am amazed. I, it's going to put me out of business, all the things that it claims it will solve. I think it increases your IQ, if I remember right. But um, those kind of things, a lot of them I think are just marketing gimmicky things. But you know, if you have certain pressure points, some of these pads can be helpful at reducing pressure from the shoe. What about just your, um, this is like overall health, but what about just Drink more wine? Does that well, I, mean, I, I feel like I can tell when I'm doing it, you know, my, my little piece swollen and it'll hurt more and stuff, and, um, and it gets kind of tingly and it gets a little like red marks in a little bit. And, um, and, you know, if you go home at the end of the day and, and you don't put your feet up, but you just go to bed so they're not necessarily like above your home, mm -hmm. or does it just through the night time just kind of, you know, get better? Or are you really supposed to like put it up? Um, I'm going to try to answer your question. If I don't, then I'll have you rephrase it because I want to make sure that I understand what it is. So if the question has to do with swelling, ways to take care of it or potentially prevent it. Yeah, that's um, um, Swelling can come from a number of different things. So one thing is to look for an underlying cause with your physician. Um, there are certain, and, and, and I'm not saying, you, you know, heart disease can cause a backup of fluids, which can cause swelling in the legs. Um, Problems with veins in the legs, where the, the vein, the valves in the veins don't tend to work as well, is a really common problem where that fluid just kind of leaks out and you get swelling in the legs. Um, inactivity, you know, our muscles, when we move, they pump and they help pump that fluid back. So that's where, man, I went on that flight from Seattle to San Antonio and I got off and my legs just like balloons. It's because you're just sitting there for hours without that pump. Um, what can be done about it? Certainly, you know, laying flat in bed at night, it will, most people, wake, they wake up in the morning and things look pretty normal, and then as the day progresses, they tend to go backwards. I don't see that, unless you have a specific injury or something that you need to elevate any more than flat in bed at night, uh, I recommend a lot, 
uh, for certain types of swelling and people usually don't embrace, but using these compression stockings, you know, that are not the most sightly thing you want to wear, but it's basically just taking elastic compression and giving you support so that you, that fluid can't leak out into the soft tissue. In some instances, putting you on a, what's it called a diuretic or a water pill, if you have a, a reason to medically manage getting rid of that fluid um, can help. That tends to make you want to run down the hall to the bathroom several times a day. So, um, but if it's significant enough that it's really pooling and you're getting tingling and, and, and you're getting color changes, it's worth having someone you know, assess it. Do they get there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And make sure that you're drinking eight ounces of water several times a day. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, can I just ask you one more for nobody's like, Okay, I had a thing like that sounded like the bunion, but it's under my left, it's under my little toe. It's mm -hmm. on the, is that the same? Is that well, a you, have, you may have the Taylor's bunion. So, is that what it's called? Yeah, you can get it on the, by your big toe, you can get it over here by your little toe. They call it a Taylor's yeah. bunion. Because Taylor's like, used to sit and use foot paddles on their sewing machine all the time. We get this little rubbing here. So. Okay, well, um, so, and so you have to cut something out of it in, in this. I, mean, I was told by, yeah. okay, we've moved a lot. And so I go to, I end up with different places. Oh, yeah, different, different, sure. Okay. So the doctor in Denver said that I, that my bones still have too far at that place and that the skin had grown over it to protect it. Mm -hmm. And then he put me in orthotics. So we did orthotics for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And now, um, basically the last doctor that I saw about it, basically he cut something out of it, mm -hmm. which which then got rid of it. And then he said to me to use a pumice stone every night. Yeah. And so I've been pumice stoning it every night, or been okay. getting bad, but, it, but it's been keeping it under control. So this is a common problem, I mean, that, that might be more than just you experience. What you've developed is some sort of, uh, if it's dry, hard skin that sometimes gets sore, a callus or a corn, whatever you might call it. And Wherever there's a bone prominence, oftentimes on a weight bearing surface like your foot, your body's response to extra pressure there is to build up this callus. And that can get painful if it's on a spot where you bear weight. Yeah. So, without having seen that foot without a shoe on, but it sounds like your other physicians are on the right track. There's some underlying bone prominence. Your body's response is this. this protective. Yeah, it's protective. So you cut that out, it feels better for a while. Uh, then it probably comes back because you haven't, you still have the underlying problem. Well, I've been, but I've been pumping. So yeah, you pumice so. it, you get this little cute little thing called the ped egg. Have you seen this? Yeah. Uh, it's, it looks shaped like a little egg. It's got a little skin grater on it. But it actually, done, there are people who do scientific studies on things like that and found that it was one of the most effective ways to get rid of calluses and corns. But um, that requires maintenance consistently. Well, that's, I mean, I. I do maintenance on it. Yeah, and the idea probably behind an orthotic there was to try and get the pressure off of it, but you know, if those things fail, then we talk about looking at x-rays and surgery, right. but certainly yeah. it's a last resort. I'm just curious, so it's called a Taylor's. Taylor, T okay, I thank you. Yes. And look, you at, look what you're doing. She has a Taylor's bunion and she's over there knitting. This is phenomenal. <laughs> what are cords? I remember my mother always saying, oh, I corned it. <laughs> Never really understood what that was. Is that just a callus? Uh, yeah. It's, Basically, a localized callus. So usually, oftentimes a callus is kind of a widespread area of dry, hard skin where you might see a big surface. A corn is really more localized, where it might be only a quarter inch in size, but it tends to be more um, acutely painful because it's usually under a weight-bearing spot or on top of a weight-bearing spot. Or maybe my brother-in-law, he lives in South Dakota and he um, farms 500 acres of corn. All right. Well, thank you very much for allowing me to come. I hope it was well. Thank you so much. And actually, I just have one little fun tidbit. I have no financial connection with shoes and feet, but I love that store. Um, I have rheumatoid arthritis. My feet um, are terribly finicky, and they just do such a great job getting that shoe fitting to me. And it's not like I'm being sold something, so I really love that place. And did you know that the other Seattle store right here where we're standing. So this this lot yeah. used to be uh, a shoe feet in another building. So um, sad to say it's just in Fremont now, yes. but uh, great place. So thank you so much. I